This week, Susan and I went to Tecumseh. Uh, it's just about five miles south of Shawnee. There's a big church down there, a big Baptist church, and, and uh, they had a whole lot of music they wanted to give to the choir. Susan had run an ad in the Baptist Messenger asking if any churches had any music they wanted to give away. We'd like to have it. We went down there, and we got a car load of music. I'm, I'm serious. The two big boxes in the back seat, and the floorboard was full. And finally, I told him, I said, hey, you know, we'll come back. I didn't bring a truck. And, and he's a school teacher, and he said, well, after school, I'll go through the rest of it and box it all up, and then you can come back and get it, or he'd ship it to us or something. But it, what amazed me is a big church, they, you know, large, about 300 in attendance. And, and he was talking about his choir. He was really proud of his choir. And I, but I looked up there, and they had just a few seats. And I said, well, how many do you have in your choir? And he said, 16. And they he turned to Susan and said, how many do you have in your choir? She said, well, we have about 20, 22, 23, something like that. And he said, well, how big a church do you have? She said, well, we have about 100 members. He said, and you got 22 people? And he just couldn't believe that. And, uh, and every one of you could sing in the choir. We have very talented people. And you know, I'll tell you something. I believe, though, probably in his church, he has a lot of talented people, too. I don't think we have a corner on the market. But you know what I think the difference is? Commitment. Our people are committed to the Lord. He had a, in his, the music room there where he kept all the music, he had a little cartoon on the board. I thought that was cute, and I, I guess he was trying to intimidate the people or shame the people or, of the church or something. I don't know, but it showed a picture of a hog sitting down, and, and it said, never try to teach a hog how to sing. It said, it only, you're just wasting your time, and it said, it just annoys the hog, you know. So I don't know why, what he, I don't know, but I, surely they got more talented people in the church than 16, but... Just about everybody here either sings in the choir, they get up and sing specials, and we're really blessed. God has really blessed us. And so, if you will, turn to the book of Job. Turn to the book of Job. Let me see where I want to begin. Let's, let's look at uh, chapter 31. i begin with verse 35. Verse 35. I'll read about three verses in the book of Job, and then we'll be reading other places in the Bible, but I want to use this as my text. Verse, uh, chapter 31, verse 35. Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. I would declare unto him the number of my steps. As a prince would I go near unto him. Job. Job went through all kinds of trials and tribulations. We know, all know the story of Job. We know that Satan came before God one day and God said, have you considered my servant Job? And he said, how can I? He said, you have a hedge about him. And God said, there's not another man like Job in all the earth. He said, he's perfect and upright in all of his ways and he hates evil. And so Satan said, well, he wanted to, he told God, he said, uh, yes, but uh, the reason that God bless, I mean, Job blesses you and is faithful to you is because uh, look at how you've blessed him. And God said, you can, t you can, uh, you can uh, curse him, but you can't touch him. And we know that immediately he lost all of his children. Then he lost all of his wealth. Then he even lost his health. And the Bible says that still Job didn't curse God. He cursed the day that he lived, but he never did curse God. He had some friends that came to see him and they accused Job of being a hypocrite. And Job kept trying to tell them, I'm not a hypocrite. He said, I, you know, he'd always given to the poor. He had always done what was right. And he was such a righteous man that when his children would get together uh, at one of their houses and have a dinner, Job would offer a sacrifice and pray for them just in case they sinned. Job was a good man. And it really bothers me when I hear people say that Job uh, was self-righteous. And I would never accuse him of that. And here's why I wouldn't. Because if you remember, Job's friends made some false accusations. 
And I'll tell you what, they were in a lot of trouble with God because of that. And God told them, men, you make a sacrifice, and if Job prays for you, I will forgive you. Now also keep in mind, at the time Job lived, he lived about the same time that Abraham did. It's believed that the book of Job was the first book written in the Bible. Job had absolutely no, no scripture to go by. All that he knew about God was experiential. All that he knew about God was what was revealed to him. But still Job did the best that he could. But for all of that, Job did have a wrong view of God. He said, why, if I could, why, I would just walk up to God as a prince. You see, in Job's mind and in Job's eyes, he evidently had a small God, he thought. He really didn't understand God. And you know, the people today are the same way. You stop and think about it. Most of us serve a small God. And what do I mean by that? By, by saying that we serve a small God, we, we put God on our plane. We'll make jokes about God. We even try to manipulate God. You see, we think that for some way, some reason or other, we've got it in our mind that God is up there and, and he's just a big sugar daddy. He's up there just to supply all of our needs and all of our wants and somehow or other, if you don't make heaven, it's just going to mess everything up for God. I mean, God just won't be able to stand it if, for, if you don't make heaven. In other words, it just wouldn't be heaven without me. I even had a man almost tell me that one time. I was talking to him, and I was witness to him. He said, well, let me tell you something. He said, I don't need to be saved. He said, my wife's saved. And he said, when she gets to heaven, if I don't make it, she's going to be sad. So he said, God's going to have to let me in, or she's going to be sad. Whew. Boy, he's got a wrong view of God. Job had a wrong view of God. Now, notice what happened. All of Job's friends were talking. And then Job would answer them. And then they'd speak some more. And then Job would reply to them. And this went back and forth and back and forth. And finally the friends just gave up and said, well, he's self-righteous. We know he's really a hypocrite. There's something he's doing. Why? Because God won't punish him if he was really a good man. There's some sin that he's doing. And you know what? Isn't it amazing? We still got that concept today. If somebody's down and out, if a Christian gets down and out or isn't prospering, we think, hmm, I wonder what he's done. And do you know something? That doesn't have anything to do with it. We find out that Job was a righteous man in the eyes of God. In other words, he was good as he could be in the eyes of God, but God was simply testing him. Now, look what God said. When they all got through talking, Look at verse 38. I'm just going to read just a little bit in verse 30, uh, chapter 38. I'm sorry, chapter 38. Now, this is when God begins to speak. The three, the three friends had already spoken. Job had said all that he had to say. Now, listen to God. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkness counsel by words without knowledge? Who is this that's talking and don't know what they're talking about? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. He said, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Who, sh who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as it had issued out of a womb. And God went on and on and on and on and on and said, Where was you when I created everything? Who are you to think you know anything at all about me? And so he goes through chapter 38 and 39. Now look at verse chapter 40. I'll tell you what, he put Job in his place. You know why? Because Job finally realized who he was, and he finally realized who God was. 
And the greatest blessing for all of us, all of us could, could, would be just that. If we realize who we are and if we realize who God is. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Then answered the Lord uh, unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up now, thy, or gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Hast thou an arm like God? Or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold every one that is proud, and abase him. Look on everything that is proud, and bring him low, and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together, and bind their face in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. In other words, God said, listen, when you understand what I understand, and when you're powerful like I am, and when you have your way in all the earth, then you are, I'll profess that you can save yourself. You see, we don't know who we're dealing with. We don't realize who we're dealing with. We're dealing with an almighty God. And he's sovereign. He don't need me, but praise God, he saved me. He don't need you, but praise God, hopefully, he saved you. He is almighty God. Now look how Job concludes this in the 42nd chapter. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be holden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me, for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. He says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I pour myself and repent in dust and ashes. He said, he said, well, God, always before, I just heard of you. But he said, now I've seen you with my eye. And he said, I pour myself in dust and ashes. He said, I didn't realize what kind of a God I was dealing with. I didn't realize your majesty. I didn't realize your power. I didn't realize your sovereignty. Look at Now turn, if you will, to, to uh, Psalms. And we get a little picture of God. What I'm trying to do is draw a portrait of God for you. Who is God? What is God? Look at the second Psalms. The psalmist says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? It's a vain thing. It's an empty thing. Why do the people, why do the, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Now, now look, look at what all is going on. We've taken prayer out of the schools. Hey, we're showing God something, ain't we? Hey, we'll just vote him right out. We'll vote atheism in. We'll vote in immor immorality. We're not going to have him rule over us. The rest of the nations, they vote him out. There's no God. You can't teach God. Just recently, they're, they're passing a law now where you can't even witness on, on the job site. You could, you could be arrested. You could be sued if you witness on the job site. We're getting God right where we want him. We don't have to listen to him. But look what it says. He's just laughing at them. They don't realize who they're dealing with. God is laughing with them. And he said, I'll have them in derision. I'll have them in confusion. Now, look what he says. Let me turn back to verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. He says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. In other words, he said, Christ is going to rule whether the world likes it or not, and they don't. And I want to tell you something. 
something Rance said. Rance, believe it or not, I know he don't look like it, but he has a lot of wisdom. And he's always saying things that we know, but, but, but we just don't think of, but he puts them into words. He was talking about his life, and he said, you know, my life's kind of like a circle, and here I am in the center. And he said, on the outside of the circle, he said, there's my family and my job and my church and the Lord, and, and here's my rest of my family and my friends and so forth. He said, you know, they, they kind of revolve, revolve, revolve around my little world, and here I am in the center. One day he said, hey, like what's wrong with this picture? He said, the Lord needs to be here. I need to be out here going around and around. So he said, I put the Lord out here, uh, in here on the throne. He said, now I'm out here revolving around. That's where it should be, isn't that right? He said, but every once in a while I'll say, wait a minute, Lord, I don't like the way things are going. I want my place back. And that's the way people do. That's the way we do in our life, isn't it? We come, we rededicate our life, we put God back on the throne of our heart. That's the reason they call it backsliding, folks. It ain't back jumping. It ain't back running. You see, a person ain't on fire for God one day. Next day, he just out. We just gradually slip backwards. We gradually get away from the Lord. That's the reason we always have to be constantly striving to keep God, Christ, in the center of our life where he rightfully belongs. Because God says, whether you do or whether you don't, Christ is still going to reign. And every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that he is the Lord to the glory of God. You see, all you're going to do is mess yourself up. Something else he said one time, and, and, and I can really relate with this. Boy, we're serving the Lord. Come on, Lord, let's go get him. And boy, we're going down through there and all of a sudden say, Hey, where are you going, Lord? You're going the wrong way. Hey, what are you doing? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like we can get so involved in little things that we're doing, you know, and we think it's the will of the Lord, and we're going to say, hey, Lord, where are you going? Uh-uh, I'm not going down there, Lord. Uh-uh, no, we're going this way. Uh-uh, that, that, don't look, that don't look healthy down in there. You know, I, I might lose my house. I might lose my, my job. I might lose my family. Well, I might even get killed going off down there. I'm not going to Russia. <laughs> Lord, you're mistaken. We've got to go this way where it's nice and safe and plenty of food and clothing. See, we don't realize that he's the Lord. Look what he says. I have set my king, already done it. He's not going to, he's already done it. I hear people say, make the Lord, the, make Christ the Lord of your life. Hey, folks, he's already the Lord. You don't make him Lord. God made him Lord. He says, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now notice what it says. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those that put their trust in him. In other words, you can do what you want to, but I want to tell you something. God's still God, and he's still going to have his way. And this, this, is, this has been this way since the beginning of time. Man, it always needs God, but God don't need you. God loves you, and God will save you, but he don't have to have you. You see, the book of Revelation says this. His heaven's going to be filled. How many realize that? It says there's going to be multitudes that can't be counted. And he knows who his elect are. He knows who they are. But God don't have to have you. And you know, it's amazing sometimes we'll give altar calls and people will just keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off like, well, God, you just, you just wait till I'm ready. Boy, that's dangerous. Boy, that's dangerous. You just wait till I'm ready. One of these days when I get this straightened out or when I get that straightened out or when I get tired of this or tired of that, well, then I might let you save me. Whoa. God's probably saying, I can't hardly wait. You know what? I love that song, Amazing Grace. That's my favorite song. And I'll tell you why it is. Because I know who God is. But I also know who I am. And I want to tell you something. God doesn't owe me anything. It's 
by his grace be saved again. Just because he's merciful. You know, there, there's a lot of this going around. I don't know whether it's going around so much now as it was, but, you, you know, some time ago, well, maybe it's just because I don't have television now. I don't know. Uh, we got one back in the back room, and I, we never turn it on. I used to watch PTL once, once in a while, and one time they had a whole bunch of big preachers on there, you know, big preachers. I don't mean size, but, I mean, they were big, and at least in their eyes they were big. But it was Oral Roberts and a lot of those big shot preachers on there. And, and it was kind of this name it and claim it stuff, you know. And Rex Humbard and his wife were on there too, and they were all sitting there. And I remember old Roberts got up and said, God owes me a million dollars. You know, just name it and claim it. And he looked at one of the other preachers and said, how much does he owe you? And said, well, he owes me two million dollars. All right. And everybody said, oh, God owes us that, you know. He finally looked over at Rex Humbard and he said, Rex, how much does God owe you? And he just said, God don't owe me anything. Boy, I mean, they got the camera off him just like, just like that. He said, God don't owe me nothing. Boy, whew, boy, they just flipped it right over there. But boy, that broke up that party. They didn't ask nobody else, what does God owe you? Because it's kind of like, well, what am I supposed to say? I don't want to make her own mad. But <laughs> See, wrong view of God. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. I woke up this morning, and it's just because of the mercy of God. All souls are mine, saith the Lord. And he said that he gives the Spirit and he calls the Spirit. Here's something that really amazes me. And it makes me shudder. I hear people blaspheme God. I hear people talk bad about God. Or I hear them take God's name in vain. That makes shudders go down my back. I told a man one time, boy, he let out a big long string of cuss words and he took God's name in vain. I said, I said, you're the bravest man I ever saw. He said, what do you mean? I said, you take the air that God gives you and you breathe it in to sustain life and then blaspheme him with it on the way out. A person that takes God's name in vain, they're the bravest person I ever saw. They're just daring God to cut their wind off. Don't forget this. Every heartbeat is a gift of God. I was talking to a doctor one time. He was a Christian doctor. And he was talking about life and the mystery of life. You see, they can take your arm off and you still live. They can take your leg off and you still live. They can drain your blood out and put more blood in and you still live. They can, they can give you a, a heart transplant and you still live. They can take the lungs out and you still live. I mean, put more in, of course, but... You know, but, but they can do all these organ transplants and you still laugh. See, it's a mystery to science. Where's life? And this doctor said, let me tell you something. God is the author of life. And he said, he is the source of life. And he said, the brain is like a transformer. He said, life comes from God through the brain that goes all down through the nerves. And he said, that's why we live and move and have our being. All God has to do is just cause a short circuit in your history. He's God. Turn to Romans, if you will, real quick. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do this one in Romans. I, I wanted to. Turn, if you will, to Revelation. Revelation, the fourth chapter. Now, this is a scene in heaven, and we get a view of God. We get a view of Christ. He said, John said, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat, sat was to look upon as a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in his sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. 
And before the throne were, uh, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the fourth beast, which had, had each of them, and the four beasts, had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor uh, and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their th crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created." God wasn't created for you. Everything was created for his pleasure. Is that a shock to you? You know what I think happens a lot of times? I think we unintentionally put people way too high. Oh, I'll just, oh, I'll tell you my wife, oh, honey, I ain't told her so much. Oh, you're so beautiful. And not only that, you're such a good woman. Oh, you're a good woman. I really love you. And, oh, you're so beautiful. And, and I think that's good to brag on your wife, don't you, hon? <laughs> she said, if not, I'll never be the one to tell you. But anyway, in other words, I, I think sometimes because maybe our wife brags on us, or we brag on our wife, or, fa or our parents brag on the children, or whatever, we get to thinking we're really something. And it was just a joke. Don't let it go to your head, okay? We get to thinking that a lot of times. And we don't see one another like God sees us. But look what it said there. When John saw the Lord, all of these beasts with six wings. Now, if you want to know exactly what they're doing, look at the sixth chapter of Isaiah, because Isaiah saw the same thing. And he said the beast had six wings. With, he said with two wings they covered their face. With two wings they covered their feet. With two wings they would fly. And they cry, constantly crying, Holy Holy, holy. And it said when the Lord came in the temple, or when the one that, that, that was crying, holy, 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 came into the temple, it said that the whole temple was full of smoke and the pillars just moved in the temple. And Isaiah said, whoa, is me. See, he probably thought he was a pretty good man because he was a prophet. Well, I must be special. God called me. But when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, he said, whoa, is me. I'm undone. I'm nothing. Just like Job he said, I've whore myself in dust and ashes. I thought I was somebody and realized I'm nothing in the sight of God. And then they go on to say everything that was created. He created it, and he created it for his pleasure. What does that mean? Because he wanted to. Do you know what? If he saved you, it's because he wants to. And I want to tell you something else, and I hope this isn't a shock to you. He doesn't save you for your sake. How many thought he did? He don't save you for your sake. He saves you for his sake. If you don't believe that, you read the second chapter of Ephesians because it said the whole reason for saving you is that in the ages to come, his grace might be on display. You see, the angels that haven't sinned, they don't understand sin. And do you know something else? The angels don't understand redemp redemption. Did you know that? Do you know what the Bible says that the school, that the church is, is uh, not in these words, I'm paraphrasing, the church is a university to educate angel angels. It says they look to see what's going on. They don't understand. Now, he came and died, and how does that save them? They can't understand. Why? Because they've never sinned. They don't understand redemption. That's the reason they can't preach the gospel. Only we can preach the gospel. And so what the purpose of God saving us, it says, is that his grace might be on display. You know, and I believe the angels, when it's all said and done, and do you know what it says? That we will be seated 
right, the church, the bride of Christ, will be seated with him on his throne. And I believe all of the angels, now there won't be any jealousy involved because they're perfect. But they can't understand. God has taken these fallen creatures that were so evil and redeemed them and exalted them that they might be called the bride of Christ. It puts God's grace on display. That's the reason I like amazing grace. You know why I like amazing grace? Because I know what I am. Do you know what you are? If you're saved, you know what you are. Listen, I want to tell you something. I don't have to go to the dump to see a lot of garbage. All I have to do is look right here. Someone said one time, a clear conscience is a lot of time is just the result of a bad memory. Does that make sense? All you have to do is just stop and think every evening. If you want to see how good you are, if you want to see how good you are, every evening when you get ready to go to bed, just stop and think, now what did I do today? You reflect over all the times you got mad, the bad thoughts you've had, the opportunities you had to witness and didn't, how many times you tried to get even with your wife or something. Of course, I know you men wouldn't do that. This is Calvary Baptist Church, but I mean, a lot of churches do that kind of stuff. And you realize, boy, it's just by grace. It's just by God's mercy. Now think about this. Here is a God sitting on a throne and the cherubim constantly, continually, throughout eternity that are holy, that, by that they have never sinned, but still, even though they have never sinned, they still, in his presence, cover their face. They do not even see themselves worthy to look upon the Savior and cover their feet and constantly cry, Holy, Holy, Holy. Now you think about this. And the pillars of the temple move and it's filled with smoke because of his glory. The same Lord 2,000 years ago got up from his throne with a rainbow and went to planet earth born of a virgin and suffered 33 years at the hands of man and went to a cross and paid your sin debt and my sin debt and in three days rose from the dead alive Right now, he don't have to do it. But right now, he walks the aisles of this church. He knocks on hearts of the world. Amazing that he'd be willing to do that. He don't have to do that. You think every one of us would be on our knees crying, Oh, God, have mercy. God, save us. But we're standing right here. Well, I know you knocked last Sunday, and I know you knocked the Sunday before that. You've been knocking for a long time, but maybe one of these days I might open the door and let you in and let you save me from an everlasting hell. Now, I want to ask you something, being human. If you had, a, had something, a marvelous present that you wanted to give to someone that you loved, and you went to their door, who's there? Well, it's your friend, Ralph. What do you want? I've got something for you. It's the most wonderful present in the world. Open the door. No, not today. Can you come back some other time? I'm kind of busy now. And you go away, and a few days later, you come back. Well, who's there? It's Ralph. I'm back, and I've got this wonderful present for you. Well, I don't know. Not, no, I'm, I'm kind of busy right now. I'm watching football, and I don't want to get it. How many times do you think you keep knocking on that person's door? Finally, when you finally come to the place where you just say, forget it, I'll give it to somebody else. How many times has God knocked at your door and wants to give you eternal life? And he don't have to. He's God. You know what? God's okay by himself, okay? You know what God isn't worried about? He's not worried about going to hell. <laughs> He's not worried about it. He's got it made. And he's going to have millions up there to enjoy heaven with him. He's got all the angels he needs. If he wants more, he'll create them. And he just wants to let you in on a good deal. 
telling Ralph the other day. Somebody come to me and say, man, I got a good deal. You just can't turn down. I said, oh, no, no, no. You, uh, you, uh. I can turn down the good deals. It's the bad deals I can't turn down. That's been the story of my life. I can turn down the good deals. It's the bad deals. And that's the way a lot of people are. A lot of people turn down the best deal that ever came your way. Right now, this morning, you'll turn it down. It's the best deal you ever had. I want to close with a story because I've got time. And it's just a story, but one time there was a, a man, he was a master woodcarver, and he had a friend that, oh, he, he just thought the world of. And he wanted to make him a beautiful table. And he wanted it to be different than any table that had ever been made. So he, he spent several months just traveling the world getting special kind of wood because he wanted it made out of several different kinds of beautiful hand-carved woods. The legs would be made out of something in the top and the drawers would. And so he traveled all over the world collecting these rare and beautiful woods. He finally got them back and he very painstakingly carved the legs and all the beautiful uh, inert hand carving and all of that. And when he finished them, th then he took months hand sanding it to perfection. And then he stained it and varnished it. It was perfect the most beautiful piece of work you could ever manage, imagine. Then he called his friend. He said, I've got something for you. He said, I want to bring it over. He said, all right. He covered it up, covered it up with a real nice, clean drop cloth. And the workman loaded it on the truck and secured it where it wouldn't have any chance of moving or falling off. And he takes it over to his friend's house. They bring it in and set it down. And he removes the drop cloth. There's a beautiful work of art. His friend looks at it and says, Oh, beautiful. But just a minute, he goes over and gets a piece of sandpaper. He says, There's one little place right here. And the master builder grabbed it and said, No, don't touch it. You'll ruin it. And I will tell you something. That's what God did. He provides a perfect salvation. Don't touch it. You'll ruin it. Just accept it as a free gift. Don't try to add to it. Don't try to add your works to it. Thank it. Well, if I do this, I'll be saved. I, I got tickled with Wayne. He's been mowing the yard. And, of course, he was just joking. But he was telling me, he said, Boy, I enjoyed mowing the yard. He said, I was telling the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm doing this for you. He said, I'm not even doing it for the church. I'm doing it for you. And, Lord, when I get up there, I'll, I'll mow your yard too. If, you, if I just get up there, you know, I, I'll mow your yard. He said, I just buttered him up, you know. You can't butter God up. See, it's by grace. Don't add anything to it. See, you've got to come as a child. You've got to accept it by simple faith. God finished it. You know what the Bible says? He is the author and the finisher of the faith. He finished it. Do you know why it, it, when, when evangelists, uh, they'll go to like to Russia or some of these countries that never had the gospel, Africa, different places where the gospel's never been preached. Do you know why they have so many people saved? You know why so many people are saved? Because, you know, like they'll, have, they'll have a big meeting. Maybe hundreds or thousands will be saved. You know why? Because, see, they haven't heard all this other stuff. In America, it's hard to be saved because, well, like my cousin, he was talking to this man, and he was trying to win him to the Lord, and he said, it's easy to be saved. The guy said, yes, it is. I know it is. He said, boy, that's staying saved. That's really hard. See, we've heard so much garbage those people hadn't, and all they hear is that Jesus died, Jesus will save those that call upon his name in simple faith. Here they come. Listen, God don't need you, but he's offering you the most beautiful piece of work, art, you ever saw, and that art is called eternal life. And this life is in his son. And the Bible says, he that hath the son hath a life. It doesn't say he that has a baptismal certificate has life. He that has, has been baptized, has his name on a roll, has eternal life. You see, he that hath the Son hath life. And I want to tell you something. He knocks at the heart's door. And the promise is, if you'll open the door and let him in, he said, I'll come in. And he said, I'll sup with you and I'll abide. And you know what else he says? I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. If, if I go to hell... Jesus will be there with me because he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Only God could provide eternal life. Only God could provide redemption. Now, he don't need you, but he does love you. 
He don't have to offer you eternal life. A lot of people, you know what a lot of people never have the offer? How many realize that? A lot of people have never been offered eternal life. There's people around the world that have never heard the gospel. It's never been offered to them. You're very fortunate. God offers you eternal life. But don't take him for granted. He's sovereign. He can offer it, and he can withdraw it 